good. So thank you very much, Joshua. It, it was really good to have you this morning. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from you now. So I'm going to hand over to you. Do you know what you're doing in terms of presenting slides and the like? Lovely. I should be able to share my screen. Um, let me just see if this is working. I'm hoping you can see my screen now. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I'm just going to see if I can go full slideshow. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Can everyone see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Nice. Well, just to say um, again, a huge thank you to Mike for this opportunity. It was lovely to join you this morning um, and to get to talk with a few of you in the breakout room um, and uh, to get to know you somewhat. Um, and a huge privilege to also be able to share with you something of our ministry. Um, Mike asked me to share a bit about us, um, a bit about what Christian heritage is and does, uh, and then a little bit about our role with Christian heritage. So my plan was to share a PowerPoint with you, um, which will hopefully be helpful to those ends. And then I wanted, before um, moving on, if, if there are any questions, um, to allow space for that. So. Um, if there are any questions, I will leave some time at the end of my PowerPoint for that. Um, this is the Kellogg family, um, the family I'm representing today. And uh, since this photo was taken, um, we've, we've had a new member join us as well. Uh, so this is my wife, Delara, son, Caspian, who's almost two. And this is Hadassah, our youngest. Uh, we call her Hadi for short. She's five weeks and a lockdown baby. Um, and so home life, as you can imagine, is quite lively, shall we say, at the moment, <laughs> as we adjust to being a family of four. We, um, as I shared a bit at the first service, are from different places. This is Almaty, Kazakhstan, where my wife grew up. Uh, it's a beautifully located city, yeah. um, the former capital of that country. Um, and Kazakhstan is kind of a, a mysterious region, um, at least to me it was before meeting my wife. I didn't know anything about Kazakhstan, not really much about Central Asia, but it's a nation of 18 million with many different ethnic groups. Kazakhs themselves make up only about 50% of the population. And she grew up in the uh, sort of the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains, which you can see here. And uh, I shared a little bit about how she became a Christian um, and uh, to cut a long story short, uh, ended up with a real heart for China. And she and I met in China, um, and we continue to have a very live interest in China and the Chinese people, which uh, does feed in to some extent to what we are doing in Cambridge. Uh, my uh, county of origin is, is Dorset, so a little less dramatic than Tian Shan Mountains. Uh, this is Hambledon Hill, an Iron Age hill fort, and I, <laughs> I grew up in that valley there. But just wanted to give you some geographical reference points for where we come from. Um, and we have been in Cambridge since 2017, after some years in China, some years in the Philippines, teaching at a Chinese school, and then uh, sensing that the Lord was calling us back to the UK, uh, at least back for me, and a new prospect for her. And it was the magnetic pull of this building which drew us back to Cambridge. Um, I had had some contact with Christian Heritage before. Uh, actually, before we moved to Asia, I came for uh, a summer school with Christian Heritage. Uh, summer schools used to be run yearly by the organization. And uh, I had spent a formative week actually here in Cambridge, which had a huge impact on me in 2007 and had followed the ministry and yet it was uh, something of a surprise that there was an opening to come and work for Christian Heritage. We kind of knew small Christian organization probably doesn't have a lot of opportunities for, um, for new workers to come in, um, but there was an opening. And so we came in 2017. And I wanted to tell you a little bit of the story of Christian Heritage. Um, I mentioned that it has a connection to the work of Labrie. And I'm going to explain a bit about what Labrie is and how it came to have a presence here in Cambridge through Christian heritage. Um, so just to sketch the, the timeline, you probably know that the Round Church is associated with St. Andrew the Great, the big Anglican church in the middle of town, as is evidenced by their logo. 
And in fact, it's more accurate to say that the Round Church congregation took over St. Andrew the Great than the other way around. Uh, they met here until 1994 uh, before moving to their larger premises because of growth. And that meant that the Round Church itself was left unoccupied, essentially. And an enterprising local man called John Martin thought that it would be great to have a work of outreach based at the Round Church. Just to say, can, can you see the text um, on the PowerPoint or is the sidebar um, stopping you from seeing it? No, that's good. I, I think we can see it. Brilliant. That's great. Uh, so John Martin had been a missionary in Pakistan, returned to back to Cambridge um, and began teaching church history at a Bible college that was then located in Cambridge. But he felt that it was uh, a golden opportunity uh, presented uh, by the vacating of the Round Church to present something of Cambridge's Christian heritage for those who came to the town to visit. So he began walking tours. Um, and his verse was from Hebrews 13, where it says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And it was actually because of his um, pressure that a blue plaque was erected on the site of the old White Horse Inn to commemorate the reformers here in Cambridge. I don't know if you've noticed on the side of um, sort of where King's College and St. Catherine's College is, there's a blue plaque to the reformers. That was John's work. And he began to put Cambridge on the map in terms of Christian heritage, in terms of pointing out the Christian roots of much of the university's history and the town's history through his walks. So John Martin led um, Cambridge Christian Heritage, as it was then, from 1994 through to 2000. And in 2000, uh, Ronald Macaulay became involved. Now, Ronald uh, was the son-in-law of Francis and Edith Schaefer, who I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and Ronald brought to the organization uh, some fresh vision. He wanted Christian Heritage to not only be offering walks that would encourage Christians, to think about their leaders, uh, those who have gone before and carried uh, the standard of faith. But he wanted non-Christians who, who visited the Round Church to also be able to have an entrance point for exploring not only Cambridge's Christian heritage, but also uh, the country's Christian heritage in a broader way. So Christian heritage um, was changed somewhat uh, in, the, in the early 2000s to an organization that had a more apologetic uh, outreach uh, side to it. Now, um, it's probably a good point to introduce the Schaefers. Um, hopefully, um, the Schaefers will be familiar to some of us. This is Francis and Edith Schaefer, uh, Americans who in the 1950s relocated to Europe. Uh, they sent Scob was calling them to minister uh, from their base in Switzerland uh, across churches uh, across Europe, um, and they began a work called Le Brie, which is uh, French for the shelter, sort of began by accident with people being invited into their home uh, and invited and made welcome to ask questions about the Christian faith. Started very naturally, it was one of their daughters bringing friends home from school um, to stay for, the, for a weekend. And then it grew, it ballooned as more and more people heard about this place where questions about faith and life were taken seriously. And from that family home grew the work of Le Brie and they acquired a number of homes in the village uh, of Champere in Switzerland. Um, and essentially what they were seeking to do was to bring the Christian message in a very relational way to any who'd listen uh, but very specifically with the deterioration of Western culture in mind. The Schaefers knew that Western culture was uh, disintegrating, and um, it's very interesting to see their impressions of that disintegration in the 50s and 60s. This is taken from the book that they wrote about their ministry, and I just want to read it because it's a good insight into the Schaefers' sense of mission and sense of calling. This is Edith Schaefer writing in 1969. She says, that which had become a deep concern to us 
was not the result of physical bombs, which had torn up and scattered orderly matter into rubble, but the philosophical and theological bombs which had torn up and scattered faith and orderly thinking. This is simply the germ of that which troubled us and gave us a fire within to do something about helping adults who might be confused in the midst of the clamor of voices in our day, and especially about children growing up with no freedom to choose because they were not aware that any educated person could believe the Bible to be true and had never heard the message of the Bible from a believing viewpoint. Uh, now, this is her reflection on their move in 1948, writing in the late 60s. So the full import of the 60s and the sexual revolution had not yet really become widely uh, realized. But even here, the Shapers were keenly aware of a call to speak to a culture in crisis. And so um, I hope that's a little a little help in understanding the sort of burden that Ranald Macaulay, their son-in-law, would bring to the work of Christian heritage in the late 90s. Now, if this is what Edith said about Western culture in the, in the 1960s, I don't know what she would quite say now with the advent of, um, of even greater uh, sexual permissiveness and the rampant confusion in our culture about truth. Um, so Labrie had two emphases, really. It continues also to have two emphases. There are numerous Labries around the world. One is the emphasis on true truth, namely that the Bible can be trusted as absolute truth from God. And God's revelation is the foundation for understanding our situation as human beings. And also true spirituality. Uh, this sense that what the Bible calls us to is not a, a super spirituality where we become something more than human, but it actually calls us back to what we were made for in the first place. And Ronald Macaulay's uh, book, which was published in the 1970s, is called Being Human. And it's a, it's a meditation on how the gospel restores us to true humanity. And that the gospel, in a very interesting way, both calls us to self-denial, as we all know it does. Discipleship is about self-denial. But not denial as an end. It's a it's a means to a realization of what God has made us in his image. So those two emphases have colored the work of Labrie, and they still continue to influence what we do at Christian Heritage as well. So the context in which we operate today as Christians, um, as I'm sure I don't need to uh, sort of labor the point, but it is becoming more difficult, isn't it, to, to be faithful as a Christian in our own society. And Oz Guinness, who interestingly came to faith in the context of a Labrie, the Labrie in Switzerland, describes our cultural moment as that of a cut flower society. Now, um, cut flowers, as we know, are beautiful for a little bit as they retain their life and their juice, but after a while they begin to wither and fade, don't they? And our society, in a sense, has cut its, uh, its roots um, in the Christian faith, and it's now enjoying sort of the last bloom of its vitality, its nourishment from that root. And as we divorce ourselves from our Christian heritage, we begin to see the effects of that confusion and decadence. And um, this is put very well, I think, by, um, by another Libri voice, uh, that of, oops, sorry, there we are, that of Dick Kyes. Um, he puts it this way, what distinguishes our time is not necessarily greater evil or immorality than before, but greater confusion about morality itself. Despite widespread and passionate moral accusations and the advent of ethics as a growth industry, moral discussion seems to be carried on with the tattered fragments of a system of meaning long abandoned. So I highlight these quotes by way of illustrating our sort of awareness of the culture that we're speaking into. We believe that um, it's important not only to encourage uh, the church with our Christian heritage, but also to demonstrate how important our Christian heritage is for the present cultural moment. And so it's with sort of a keen sense of the current confusion about right and wrong, about ultimate meaning, 
that we seek to to uh, make the Christian perspective known uh, from the round church and in the events and the lectures that we run. So that's kind of the context. Um, and that was definitely the sense that Ronald McCauley, the shape he gave to the work in the early 2000s. Um, and in the last few weeks, I suppose this has been just driven home even more. Um, I don't know if you followed uh, the, the Twitter spat around JK Rowling, which made it into the mainstream media. She got in trouble, of course, for her comments uh, on biological sex, for daring to suggest that biological sex was something that was real and should be respected. Of course, that is anathema in our current climate where the trans movement denies that biological sex has any purchase or authority. Um, and of course, we've all been familiar in the wake of the awful killing of George Floyd of the Black Lives Matter movement. And that is, again, another key cultural uh, discussion on which it's really important for us to develop a Christian mind. Um, because, of course, we ought to be very clear that no Christian should have any trouble affirming that Black Lives Matter. And I think we need to be very sensitive as we address issues of uh, racism and structural racism in society. But of course, we're also aware that's not necessarily the whole story, that uh, there are also other cultural uh, factors in play. And particularly over the last few weeks, I think we've seen, it's fair to say, we've seen evidence of a very self-righteous side of our culture as we look back on our history and take a very, um, uh, take a very critical stance towards um, uh, uh, our history in the past. We need wisdom as we pass these matters, being sensitive to the very real issue of racism while being also wise in how we engage those issues. I just raise these two um, issues to point to the need for a Christian mind today. That's very much what we hope to be able to speak with, is a, a wise and compassionate Christian mind on key issues that face us. That's a bit of the background of Christian heritage and explains um, our, our central mission, uh, which is to practice cultural apologetics that is compassionate and wise. I would define cultural apologetics as engaging key cultural issues of the day with a biblical mind in order to commend obedience to Jesus Christ. There are all kinds of uh, apologetics. Uh, there's that which tries to show the reliability of the Bible. Um, there are various ways of arguing for the truth of Christianity. Um, but perhaps one of the more neglected signs of apologetics is this engagement, positive engagement with key issues that are being talked about in our day. And so what cultural apologetics tries to do is to answer questions that people are asking today and to discern the spiritual realities behind those questions. It also challenges pretensions, which are set up against the knowledge of God. So 2 Corinthians 10.5 teaches us that there are pretensions. There are ideas that become embedded in our conversations as a culture, which are actually very much anti-God and anti his revelation. And it's very important for us to discern what those are. But it also gets to the heart of Christianity um, being not only true, but also good. If you remember back in the Garden of Eden, the enemy attempts to persuade Eve, not only that God is a liar and that what he says is not true, but also he casts aspersions on God's goodness um, by asking uh, her to consider that God may be trying to withhold from Adam and Eve something that's good. And I would say that today, as well as believing that Christianity isn't true, most people would also question whether it's good, whether it's had a good influence as well. And as cultural apologists, what we want to do is to show how Christianity is good news. It's true, it's good, and it's beautiful. It helps us to tell a better story for, Christian uh, for, for human flourishing. I'd also say it's also a very timely discipline um, because of this assault on Christianity. You know, people used to think that Christianity may not be true, but at least it helps you to be a good person. Uh, well, I don't think many people would hold that today. Christianity is often seen, as we've said, as a source of oppression. And I'd say cultural apologetics is um, geared towards serving both non-Christians and Christians. It helps us in evangelism, as we seek to show that 
God is good and his plans for us are good, but it also helps us in discipleship to address ourselves to discerning the key issues of the day. And so it involves demonstrating Christianity in word, deed, and imagination too. And perhaps it's relevant to everyone um, in the sense that um, we are all interested in the issues of Christian of, of human life. And cultural apologetics shows how, how the Christian faith has been good news in all sorts of spheres of life. So how in practice do we go about doing cultural apologetics? Well, let me just give you a very quick survey of 20 years of Christian Heritage's outreach. How have we done this in the past? Well, guided walks, that's a big part of our outreach. We want to tell a, a story as we trace how the gospel shaped our society for good. In the visitor center, people come in and they can see a film and also read an exhibition which tells that same story um, of the gospel's impact. Um, we've done mentoring, uh, particularly through our apprenticeship program, and we run lectures and events on all sorts of topics from feminism uh, to the state of the university uh, to art um, uh, to philosophy. Uh, there's been something for everyone. In the past, we've run summer schools, and without giving too much away, this is something that we do hope to revive in the future as well. These are times of extended retreat um, so that Christians can be refreshed in their faith and can see how it applies to a particular field. In the past, summer schools have touched on uh, psychology, they've touched on um, the reliability of the Bible, uh, science and faith, all sorts of subjects um, have been explored. We've done Saturday schools of theology as well, uh, um, and we've also run uh, an apprenticeship in in the Christian worldview. So in all of these um, avenues, we're seeking both to offer a cultural apologetic, but also to train up those who are interested um, among, the, uh, among Christians um, in offering a cultural apologetic. What does the work look like today? That's an important um, thing just to mention. Well, primarily, I suppose our front door is the visitor center. And we rely on volunteers uh, to, to help us keep the visitor center open, as well as to help us lead the guided walks. And the guided walks are, I suppose I, I, suppose I may be biased because I, I lead the team that does the guided walks, but I think the guided walks are a unique opportunity to tell the story. Because essentially, um, Cambridge tells the story for us. We get to the privilege of guiding people around this town and essentially pointing them to the evidence of the gospel's transformation. Lectures and events which continue uh, through lockdown in the form of webinars, um, but we aim to put on a varied program of events that will be a blessing hopefully not only to uh, non-Christians but also to Christians who are interested in connecting culture and Christ and seeing how the gospel works itself out in human life. Then we do, and I say we do when we're open, <laughs> Uh, but we do lunch tables, which aim to explore in a concentrated way um, how, in a bit of a deeper way, how the gospel connects to life. So I'll just mention this. This may be of interest. If your schedule enables you to be free around lunch time, um, then from Tuesday to Friday, uh, we have these lunch tables um, and we'll be looking to open them up as soon as that's possible. And you'd be very welcome to come and be part of those conversations Again, those will be signposted on our website. And then study days. These are things we've run informally in the past and come the autumn will be a formal part of our outreach. We're expanding the walks into uh, study day packages. So we're gonna do a re reformation study day that will involve a walk, but also some interactive um, seminar sessions as well as a lunchtime conversation. And we'll be uh, letting local churches know more about that. And then we also uh, aim to um, offer thoughtful uh, written pieces on our website and also make our staff available for speaking in different contexts as well. Uh, as well. So those are the things that we do uh, today. We have four themes that we seek specifically to speak to consistently. And these are faith and history. So we want to show how history testifies to God's goodness. The human person, 
So we recognize that there is an assault on what it means to be made in the image of God today, which takes many forms. So we talk about artificial intelligence, transhumanism, uh, abortion, euthanasia, and all sorts of other ways in which God's design for human beings is undermined. God in the university, obviously that's a very uh, relevant theme for us being located in Cambridge. But uh, the university, unfortunately, today uh, becomes an echo chamber for a lot of secular ideas and has moved away in large part from its Christian underpinnings. And we want to be a prophetic voice challenging that drift and um, pointing people to the Christian faith as a, the only worthy um, root system for the university. And then we also talk a lot about secularization and how as Christians we can deal with a society that today in no uncertain terms is post-Christian. So I hope that's helpful in terms of speaking to some of the things we want to be uh, addressing routinely. My role, uh, just to come on to a little bit about what we do for Christian Heritage, involves leading the guides group. So I'm responsible for training guides. Um, I coordinate the lunch tables. Uh, and what I meant to say is um, that our lunch tables are going online in a new way. Uh, from September, we're going to be doing a number of book groups. And it was great to see that as a church, you've been doing some book groups recently. Um, I'll be sending out more information about those groups. Uh, and I'll make sure I copy Mike into to that mail out as well. So if anyone's interested in discussing some, some books on Christ and culture with us, that will be the form of the lunch tables until we can formally open again. I'm also responsible for content, so whether it's exhibitions or walks, the blog, or other things that we're writing, uh, that's my responsibility to make sure our content is up to date and engaging. So that's developing material, uh, writing and editing, and also putting together seminars and lectures. Um, so uh, the lecture program is uh, also something which I oversee. And then um, I wanted also briefly to share about um, a burden that's been on my heart for the last two to three years and which um, is becoming something of, uh, of a main theme for, for, for what I do. Francis Schaeffer, as well as speaking to uh, the area of apologetics, wrote a book in 1979 called Whatever Happened to the Human Race? And it made him one of the earliest voices in the evangelical world to be speaking into the whole issue of abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia, uh, which until that point, the evangelical church had been largely silent on. Uh, it was really Schaefer and Stott that were the outstanding contributors in the early decades of uh, liberalized abortion in this country. Um, and yet today, very sadly, of course, we're in a position really of looking back on 50 years since 1967, and we have, I think, to conclude that the church has been largely silent on the issue, or at least uh, ineffective at being um, uh, an, an advocate for the unborn. And so very recently, we've established a local initiative called Life Prayer. This started just back in the autumn, which seeks to make people aware uh, of the, uh, the, the critical um, condition of, uh, of uh, the, the abortion issue in, the, in our country and to gather people on a monthly basis from across Cambridge's churches to pray for the unborn, for the vulnerable elderly, and for justice in our, in our legal system, in our national life. So that happens every Monday, every first Monday of each month, happening on Zoom at the moment. And so I'm involved with that, um, and I'm also involved with a ministry called Brefos. I'm part of the uh, extended speakers team for Brefos, um, and essentially, Brefos is an organization committed to equipping the church to speak up for the unborn and their mothers um, and to uh, support the churches as they seek to love the unborn. So uh, some of my um, energies on the pro-life issue are carried out in the context of Christian heritage, and some of them are happening in the context of life prayer and of Brefos. If you'd like to know more about the Life Prayer gatherings, you'd be very welcome to, uh, to write to us and we can send a Zoom invitation to you. Our next gathering will be on August the 3rd, and we'll be hearing from James Porter, who's very much involved in establishing um, pro-life groups in universities across the nation. And he'll be in conversation with us about the state of 
the, um, the pro-life cause in our universities. I should also mention that um, uh, a huge matter for prayer for us is uh, care for those in crisis pregnancy situations locally here in Cambridge. Um, I can't say too much at this stage, but there are conversations beginning to happen uh, about a potential crisis pregnancy centre in the town. So that's very exciting at an early stage. So we very much value your prayers as those go forward. Mike asked me to talk a bit about um, our needs, um, both as the Kellan family and as Christian heritage. So uh, some matters for prayer uh, that I've isolated are, um, we mentioned this earlier, discernment about when we can open the round church. It's not an easy decision because we rely a lot on volunteers um, and some of those fall into the high risk category. Um, and there are also financial repercussions of not having many visitors in town. So that's a, a tough one at the moment, but we long to be open again. We long to be offering walks again. Certainly we've got itchy feet to be telling that story again. So please do pray for that. Please pray for fruit from our webinars on Christ and culture until we're able to open up and have our um, cozy and intimate evenings at the Round Church with wine and nibbles. We're having to go on to Zoom. Um, so that's a frustration, but it's also an opportunity to speak to more people in far-flung places. Please do pray for, and this is a bit of a naughty prayer request because I'm also letting you know of our need <laughs> for volunteers, but we do uh, rely on volunteers from local churches to greet people at the visitor center and also to lead walks. And um, we'd be very welcome if, if that, either of those things might be of interest to you, you're very welcome to contact me and I can let you know a bit more about what is involved. Um, but volunteers in the wake of lockdown, uh, that's a definite need because we're not sure how people will feel about returning to normal life after we're able to open up. Uh, so that's a real, uh, real need. We want to be able to greet people and to, to lead a growing number of walks. Please pray for funding, uh, both for our family and for Christian heritage. Um, a brief uh, explanation of this request is that as the Kellard family, we raise our own support to work for Christian heritage. Um, and Christian Heritage, although we do have, as it were, a business side to our operations, we do, um, uh, uh, obviously there, is, there are some charges uh, for coming in and for going on a walk. Basically, we only pay about 1.5 salaries, um, one and a half salaries. It's not enough alongside our overheads. It's not enough really to pay our staff team. So there are ongoing funding needs, particularly in the wake of COVID. And please pray for significant ministry partnerships locally. Um, we would love to be more of a resource to local churches. We, we don't believe that our ministry is a substitute for the local church. Uh, all of us on the team, no matter which church we go to, are committed to the local church. And we want to make sure that Christian heritage is a channel for local churches and a resource as much as is possible. Um, so that's a real uh, prayer concern for us. Uh, we want to be walking hand in hand with uh, local churches uh, as much as possible. So loud, um, I hope we're, we're doing all right for time. Mike can jump in if necessary, but if there were any questions, um, I would love to, to make this a bit more interactive. I'm aware that I often share uh, from my own perspective what might be most interesting um, but sometimes I don't get that judgment right. And there may be things I haven't shared, or maybe I've only said a little bit about that you might be interested to hear about. So um, if that's the case, um, I'm going to try and stop sharing my screen so that I can see you again. And um, I'd love to, uh, maybe you've got a comment, maybe you've got a question to open up the, the conversation there. So.